In Matthew 24, Yeshua tells us of the signs of the end of the age. False messiahs, false prophets, abounding lawlessness, persecution of the saints, wars, rumors of wars, famines, and earthquakes. He says, all these are but the beginning of the birth pains. In this video, we'll outline practical preparations worth considering amidst the collapse of world systems, which has already begun. Gold and silver, cryptocurrency, food reserves, and more. Let's dive in. No one can deny the signs of the end nor the frequency and intensity of these contractions. So let us not be ignorant of the times and seasons of the Lord, for our Master draws near. Matthew 24 verse 33 reads, So also, when you see all these things, you know that He is near, at the very gates. Recently, Yahweh has been emphasizing this, laying aside the plans of Ben to highlight the signs of His return and how we as sons can position ourselves to thrive during global failure, so that we would not be outwitted by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his designs. 2 Corinthians 2 verse 11 As sons, there are practical preparations we can make in response to these prophetic promptings. While this is not the word of the Lord, nor is it financial advice, I believe it to be wisdom worth considering for those who have not yet received specific instruction from the Lord regarding their unique circumstances. This is not a replacement for that, but it's something. Once again, I encourage you to use the methods outlined in our training on asking God questions to receive instructions specific to you. I also understand not everyone is there yet, so here we are, doing something a bit different because we're family, and family helps family. Firstly, we need to wake up to the global economic crisis and the collapse of currencies, which has been hidden behind smoke screens of pandemics and wars. Previously, I shared a prophetic dream where I watched the nations of the world intentionally cause an economic collapse in order to reset to digital currency, audibly hearing the phrase, fiat is fake. For reference, Investopedia defines fiat as government-issued currency that is not backed by a commodity such as gold. Fiat money gives central banks greater control over the economy because they can control how much money is printed. Most modern paper currencies, such as the US dollar, are fiat currencies. Yahweh continued this theme as he showed us hyperinflation, the crash of the dollar, retirement savings disappear, and the collapse of real estate. The US dollar, also known as the petrodollar, has been the global reserve currency for the past 50 years as a result of a deal struck with Saudi Arabia, in which oil is only to be sold to the nations in US dollars. While the US dollar has no physical backing since its removal from the gold standard in 1971, its status as a global reserve currency has helped to prevent its collapse. The reality is, it's absolutely worthless and backed purely by perception. Talk about a witty invention. Saudi Arabia has now agreed to sell oil to China in Yuan, effectively ending the US dollar's status as a global reserve currency. All this to say, it's got nothing going for it, just like the euro, Canadian dollar, and so forth. And yes, I'm aware the news has reported Saudi Arabia is only in talks to do this, but this press release alongside the Federal Reserve's statement that they foresee a global reserve currency outside the US dollar is an insider announcement to those in the know, with the intention that the rich get richer. Really, it's already done. Consider this in light of the West's recent economic sanctions against Russia, which has acted to split the global economy in half. Russia, China, Brazil, and India versus Europe and North America. Skilled investors have realized this and have been removing their money from the markets. Recently, Bill Gates sold virtually all his stocks, buying up farmland and commodities critical during crises, such as agriculture and water. Tesla has been moving funds towards physical and paper gold, with theater operator AMC purchasing a 22% stake in a gold and silver mining company. When news like this is breaking every day, and it is, collapse is imminent. The writing is on the wall, folks. So, if fiat currency is declining into oblivion, what's a person like you or me to do? Historically, the greatest hedge against inflation has been, drumroll please, gold. While Yahweh has shown me much about gold and its value, echoing what we see in the scriptures, I myself do not purchase gold. Why? Well, Yahweh's instructions for me have been a bit unconventional. But I do know a bit about it, so here's your one-on-one -on, -one on metals. With dozens of visions this year regarding gold and silver, reaffirming what we see historically and in scripture, I believe diversifying outside of currency and into precious metals is wise financial stewardship. There are four major metals, gold, silver, platinum, and palladium. The two monetary metals are gold and silver. 
These are referred to by many as God's money, and we see their use throughout Scripture as a monetary instrument from Genesis to Revelation. In Haggai 2 verse 8, Yahweh states, The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. Gold and silver is real money, possessing inherent value since their creation. Contrast this with fiat currency, which historically is doomed to go to zero every single time. As for cryptocurrencies, they're still relatively new and highly speculative. Since the Russia-Ukraine conflict, something interesting happened. Cryptocurrencies declined, whereas gold and silver shot upward, revealing where people really put their trust. Since the conflict, acquiring physical metal has been even more difficult as existing global shortages have intensified dramatically. Silver has been nearly impossible to acquire as sovereign mints simply can't acquire enough raw material to meet supply. Even the U.S. Mint just announced a suspension in minting certain coins due to lack of silver blanks. As with anything physical that possesses value, it runs out. Unlike fake fiat, it can't be freely printed. If you decide on converting fiat to silver, prepare to be patient and do some digging, picking up what you can, where you can, always betting the authenticity of the vendor. The price of gold and silver is continually fluctuating, viewable on goldprice.org, among many other places. The price you see here is referred to as a spot price. When purchasing gold or silver, you notice the price you pay is higher than spot. This difference is referred to as the premium. The premium is a result of the labor involved in resourcing, minting, marketing, and selling the metal, and this premium varies across vendors. It is also affected by supply and demand. The premium on gold is much less than silver, in part because the demand for silver is so high. Silver, being more accessible than gold, also takes up about 66 times more space. So keep that in mind as physical possession and physical storage is critical. If you don't hold it, you don't own it. As for how to store metals, you typically want at least some within reach in case of emergency. Some choose to store their metals in secure, guarded vaults locally or internationally. The level of security this provides varies geographically. Others keep it all at home. Again, Yahweh's instructions for me have been a bit different, so ask him where to put it, not me. Gold, which is far more costly than silver, is primarily a means of wealth storage, whereas silver is used to transact with. Which you choose is determined by your usage and how much you're spending. Are you seeking to preserve your wealth or to have a means of purchase when fiat currency is irrelevant? At least, that's what my research says. But it's a little more complicated when you consider the gold to silver ratio. This is a simple calculation which indicates how many troy ounces of silver you can purchase per one troy ounce of gold. A troy ounce, by the way, is 31.1 grams. Historically, the gold to silver ratio is 12.5 to 1. As I prepare this video, it's 77 to 1, or 66 to 1 if you account for premium, and you should. What this means is, silver is significantly underpriced when the historical ratio is considered, costing less than one-fifth of what it ought to when compared with gold. If you consider the mining ratio, that is, how many troy ounces of silver are mined for each troy ounce of gold, it's just 7 to 1. This doesn't add up, and it doesn't add up because the price of gold and silver is fake. The metal itself is real, but the spot price is heavily manipulated. COMEX, an abbreviation for the Commodity Exchange Incorporated, is the primary futures and options market for trading metals such as gold, silver, copper, and aluminum. And yet, virtually all trades made on COMEX never move from paper into the physical. What that means is, for every physical ounce of gold or silver that exists, hundreds of traders own that same ounce on paper. I've used the word fake enough, so sit on that for a minute and think up another word. Silver faces much heavier manipulation than gold, greatly in part due to its critical industrial use. Pure silver is the best conductor of electricity in the world, and it is used widely in electronics. The device you're watching this on, there's silver in it. The car you're driving, silver. Microchips, medicine, photography, green energy, water purification, silver. If silver goes up, so does everything else. And the other side of the manipulation, the higher gold and silver is valued, the less fiat currency is valued. Remember, the only thing fiat currency is upheld by is the perception of the people, and if that perception collapses, so does the currency. There are massive, many billion dollar institutions who task themselves with suppressing these prices as a means to prevent this, all the while accumulating bargain gold and silver themselves. There's a reason so-called elites are buying up gold and silver. It's real money. When it comes to purchasing, all gold and silver is not made equal. 
Paper holdings such as comics are a scam, with physical delivery being virtually impossible. Jewelry has huge premiums, is mixed with other metals, and is only worth its melt value. You're paying a multiple for a fraction of a metal. Pass. This leaves us with bullion, which is typically gold or silver with 99.9% .9 or greater purity. One troy ounce is a staple size for both gold and silver. For gold, we have fractional gold, such as one-tenth of a troy ounce, one-quarter, one-half, and so forth. The smaller the denomination, the higher premium you'll pay. For silver, given its more accessible price tag, there's not much value in moving below one ounce. Rather, we have more options in higher weights, 10 ounce, 1 kilogram, and 100 ounce being the most popular. The higher the denomination, the lower the premium, but the more difficult it is to transact with. As for the 100 ounce, think of trying to purchase a chocolate bar at a convenience store with a $1,000 bill. Not going to happen. For most, 1 ounce, 5 ounce, and 10 ounce silver is optimal, first accumulating a generous supply of 1 ounce before moving higher, lest you have difficulty transacting. With bullion, you have a choice between bars and coins. With 1 ounce and below, coins are the way to go. They're far more difficult to counterfeit and are the more recognizable option, preferred among sovereign mints. Moving to 5 ounce and greater, bars. Coins of this size typically demand a higher premium as they possess collector attributes, which is irrelevant as a means of preparation when the goal is quantity of metal. There is another category of gold and silver which is designed specifically for collectors, and this is referred to as numismatics. Avoid this. The premiums are outrageous as you're paying for design appeal and collectability over metal value. There are sovereign coins, which is bullion minted by or for a government and denominated in local currency, and there are private rounds, which are coin-shaped, minted by a private company and are not backed by the government. The latter typically has a lower premium. Either is fine, with sovereigns preferred if the price is lower or equal. Opting for private rounds is beneficial if the discount is substantial enough. All things equal, acquiring the coin of your nation is preferable during times of barter due to local recognition. For the U.S., this is a silver eagle or gold eagle. For Canada, the maple leaf. All things equal, acquiring the coin of your nation is preferable during times of barter due to local recognition. For the U.S., this is a silver eagle or gold eagle. For Canada, the maple leaf. For the U.K., the Britannia, and so forth. Remember to consider the premium. For many Americans, the Canadian silver maple leaf, for instance, is a far better purchase than the silver eagle due to the silver eagle's monstrous premium. Depending on where you live, you may be subject to taxes on your purchase. Do some research into your local laws to discover if there are certain coins exempt to taxes, and there are, and purchase those. For instance, in Canada, if we purchase gold or silver that is not pure, such as the Gold Eagle which is 92.5% purity versus a standard 99.99%, there is a sales tax charged as it is not considered bullion. While the Gold Eagle possesses a lower purity, it still contains one ounce of pure gold like other sovereign coins, with the difference being additional metals are added as a hardening agent. Pure gold is incredibly soft, so handle with care. While gold doesn't tarnish, silver does, so store silver in airtight containers. Purchase from a credible vendor, whether online or in person. In metals, discounts don't exist, and if you find one, you're probably being scammed. Ensure the vendor has a credible online presence with plenty of positive reviews. And if you can, purchase enough at once to avoid shipping charges. We want to keep unnecessary costs to a minimum to acquire as much of the physical metal for our money as possible. While there is no sales tax on precious metal purchases in Canada, in the U.S., states have varying thresholds to bypass sales tax. Under $1,000 often adds sales tax, while over $1,000 does not. In these instances, it's often better to save up until you reach the no-tax threshold. One of the added values of possessing physical metal is bypassing centralized systems which can freeze and seize your assets with a click and without due process. Consider what happened in Canada recently as the government responded to peaceful protesters by freezing their accounts and threatening them with harsh financial penalties. Centralized systems include the banking system, stock markets, retirement savings and pension plans, among others. These are extremely high risk, not only given the government's ability to unlawfully interfere with your assets, but the bank's ability to launch a bail-in. Clients of a bank act as uninsured creditors of the bank, meaning the bank is able to seize clients' funds to prevent their collapse, exchanging them for worthless bank shares. This happened in Cyprus in 2013, and the masses were brainwashed by the media into believing it was a good thing. Like Comex, banks don't physically possess what they claim to. Ever tried to withdraw more than $5,000 cash from your account? 
Try it and see what happens. After being grilled with questions as to what you're doing with your own money, they may just tell you what they don't want anyone to know. They don't have it. And that's what happened in the Great Depression. The masses panicked, flocking to their banks in hordes, banging on the doors, begging to withdraw their own money. But they couldn't, because the bank didn't have it. Lastly, I'm reminded of one of John Paul Jackson's instructions regarding his perfect storm prophecy, to keep printouts of financial records and payments. When everything's digital, it's not so difficult to blame, I don't know, Russia with wiping out digital holdings, is it? Moving to cryptocurrency, this is highly speculative, with many incorrectly believing that the possession of cryptocurrency means bypassing the aforementioned centralized systems. We saw how untrue this was when the Canadian government recently demanded crypto exchanges freeze assets of specific users, to which they were forced to comply. There's a reason most exchanges require identification and verification with sign-up. We're also seeing global governments seeking to regulate crypto to death as they move to replace it with their own sovereign iterations, which you can bet, like fiat, will be backed by nothing, without non-monetary function, and worthless. Compound this with exchanges like Coinbase, the largest in the world alongside Kraken, who, like Comex, have sold more coins than they possess, and you risk your account being frozen for no other reason than they sold you something they don't have. And by the way, this has already happened with Coinbase. I myself have crypto in there I can neither buy nor sell, effectively frozen for years, legally freeing them from the obligation to deliver on what I purchased. With crypto, it's safest to move funds off centralized exchanges and into cold stores, which are physical hardware wallets such as Ledger and Trezor. Ideally, have at least one backup hardware wallet linked to your account alongside some means of recovery should the hardware wallets become inaccessible. All that said, crypto, unlike physical gold and silver, is reliant on technology. In a doomsday situation with world systems crumbling around us, the electrical grid and the internet are susceptible. While the hardware wallet is proactive in nature, it doesn't solve for everything. If the other end of your transaction isn't able to receive crypto as a means of payment, and that's most people, what do you do? If all this sounds confusing, don't sweat it. Rewind to the gold and silver chapter. As for cash, it's good to have some on hand, enough to purchase fuel and food in the short term. Credit card systems can fail as we saw in Ukraine or be suspended as punishment as we saw in Russia. In emergency situations like these, there are windows of times prior to the collapse of sovereign currency where physical cash can help you out of a jam. Speaking of credit cards, if you have credit card debt, get out of it as soon as you can. If your credit score is decent enough, you may be able to transfer your balance to another card with a 0% introductory rate, which can last about 12 to 18 months. Without the burden of interest, you can hack away at the principal debt and be freed from what could otherwise be a vicious debt cycle. On the topic of interest, consider getting out of variable rate interest, also known as floating or adjustable rate. During economic crises, there eventually comes a point where low interest rates, like we have now, can no longer be sustained as it effectively acts as free money. This is done to stimulate the economy and delay economic catastrophe, which only worsens at a multiple as a result. While national banks in the West have begun raising their interest rates with talks for many more increases, there is a likelihood of returning to lower rates when we really begin to feel the economic pain. Again, this is done to artificially stimulate growth and give the people false hope, as if things are being managed well and everything will be okay, when it isn't and won't be. This is short-lived, eventually leading to massive interest hikes as hyperinflation devours the dollar, as Adonai revealed to me in this prophetic dream. Earlier this year, the Lord instructed me to switch my mortgage from variable rate to fixed rate, despite over doubling my interest rate. As many people, businesses, and governments are over-leveraged to an incredible degree, when interest rates spike, they become unable to cover the increased payments leading to bankruptcy, house foreclosure, and so forth. This is when we see the real estate market collapse. Pair this with surging property taxes arising from the decreasing purchasing power of the dollar, artificially inflating the value of homes and consequently tax bills. For instance, my home has nearly doubled in price since I purchased it in the summer of 2020. Really, it's not that my home has nearly doubled in value, but that the dollar has decreased that much. This doesn't equate to profit, just a larger tax bill. Now, this is where things get interesting. During an economic crisis, liquidation occurs. This is a time of panic, where people withdraw from the markets and sell their assets. This is a time to exercise emotional intelligence, not panic, and reap the fruits of preparation. This is both a buying opportunity and an opportunity to help others. When land, businesses, buildings, and homes sell for potentially pennies on the dollar, 
If Yahweh so instructs, we can position ourselves to purchase these, even employing the original owners as a means of providing for them. If this sounds familiar, it's because it's what Yahweh instructed Joseph to do during global economic collapse and famine. Genesis 47 verse 18 to 19 reads, And when that year was ended, they came to him the following year and said to him, We will not hide from my Lord that our money is all spent. The herds of livestock are my Lord's. There is nothing left in the sight of my Lord but our bodies and our land. Why should we die before your eyes, both we and our land? Buy us and our land for food. And we, with our land, will be servants to Pharaoh, and give us seed that we may live and not die, and that the land may not be desolate. As a result of Joseph seeing the word of the Lord, acting on it, and preparing, he was positioned for power and influence, delivering the world from starvation as he preserved their lives and accumulated unfathomable wealth. And now, here's a real test. During economic crisis, will you be faithful to give? Will you exercise hilarious generosity and provide for those in need? Will you steward what Yahweh has given you, even if it seems like you just don't have enough? Proverbs 19 verse 17 reveals, Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will repay him for his deed. Proverbs 22 verse 9 adds, The generous will themselves be blessed, for they share their food with the poor. James 1 verse 27 tells us, Pure and undefiled religion before our God and Father is this, to care for orphans and widows in their distress. However you give to the poor is between you and Yahweh. But for your own benefit, give to the poor. And remember this, during an economic crisis, your perception of who qualifies as poor may radically shift. Pick up a box of budget Bibles to have on hand as you care for them. Luke 6 verse 38 promises, Give and you will receive. Your gift will return to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over and poured into your lap. The amount you give will determine the amount you get back. If you feel a pressure coming on you to provide not only for your family but for others, rebuke it. That's a lie from the pit of hell, because 2 Corinthians 9 verse 8 illuminates the truth. It reads, And God will generously provide all you need. Then you will always have everything you need and plenty left over to share with others. Last year, I learned of Teruma, which is a Hebrew principle of giving 2.5% gross income to your teachers. I was taught that Teruma returns to you with increase quite quickly. I began giving Teruma monthly to a teacher Yahweh highlighted. Only weeks later, I received a large recurring monthly trade, donation, that covers it one-to-one. Since then, that amount has roughly quadrupled across additional brethren. An interesting component of giving is that it is a singular instance in Scripture where we're permitted to test the Lord. Malachi 3 verse 10 reads, Bring a full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. Shifting to fuel, there is an orchestrated attempt to force famine in order to increase government dependency and control. Yahweh showed me this in 2020 when I was translated to three layers of hell and observed no fresh meat or produce, only what appeared to be rations of pre-packaged unhealthy foods. Skyrocketing fuel costs equates to severe price increases across shipping, farming, goods, everything. Farms are being priced out, unsure if it's even economically feasible to plant crops. On the fuel side, consider purchasing a number of gas cans while following fuel safety guidelines. A fuel stabilizer can extend gas life up to 24 months, but ideally the gas should be used within 6 to 12 months of filling, transferring old gas into your vehicle before refilling the cans. A gas generator with an extra long extension cord pairs well with this as a means of preserving food or powering essentials during power outages. In regards to food, existing fertilizer shortages have been greatly exasperated with the West's cancelling of Russia preventing the export of fertilizer and coal. In 2020, Russia was the world's number one exporter of agricultural fertilizers worldwide and the number three exporter of coal. These issues are amplified by China's new round of strict lockdowns, the very suspect destruction of a northern Taiwan grocery logistics center, which was the eighth largest retailer in the world, the destruction of additional grocery distribution centers such as Indiana's Walmart, the Canadian government ordering the destruction of 136 million kilograms of potatoes in Prince Edward Island, entire nations preparing for global famine as they suspend food exports and bird flu. With millions of chickens being killed and discarded, this crisis is not only contained to meat, but the innumerable packaged goods which utilize eggs. So what do we do about it? Consider having at least six months of food on hand. Go through your local Costco or discount grocery store and search for foods with ample expiration dates. Consider complete proteins like rice and beans, as well as protein powder, bags of rice, flour, dried pasta, pickled and canned goods. 
Get a freezer and a cheap vacuum sealer, sealing meat for freezer storage. You can pick up meat in bulk from grocery warehouses, farms, online meat shipping services, and the like. I've been doing this for years, as vacuum sealed meat lasts two to three years in the freezer. Food shortage or not, this is just good practice. For those willing to go a step further and get their hands dirty, consider hydroponics tents, which allow the growth of potatoes, beets, and other hardy vegetables utilizing non-GMO seeds. This may seem like a lot of food to have on hand, but eventually you'll work through it, food shortages or not. At the very least, you saved a good chunk of money by saving the cost of inflation on goods. These have been simple, practical means of preparation. But if we ignore the provider behind these, the one who sustains us with every blessing of breath, all of this is a fool's errand. The greatest key I can share with you is Psalm 91, which is a promise contingent on the first two verses, which read, He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in Him I will trust. Fix your gaze in Yeshua. Don't get distracted by preparation, and don't be overwhelmed by the pressures of collapsing world systems. Give Him your cares, for His yoke is easy and His burden is light. In the words of Eric Gilmore, snuggle, don't struggle. This video has been different. I believe there's a necessity to it, an exercise of wisdom for those who are able to do so, but at the same time, remember who your God is. In Psalm 37 verse 25, King David writes, I have been young, and now I'm old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken or his children begging for bread. He is the God of compassion, provision, and multiplication. If you're not in a position to prepare materially, Praise the Lord, because if you cling to Him, He's going to take care of you just fine. As we learned in our video on multiplication during times of crisis and famine, the supernatural is about to break out for the glory of God and the love of the broken. It's not about having enough gold and silver, buying up land, or keeping our tummies full. It's about Him. Everything is about Him. It's so easy to get caught up in end times events, in crises, tribulation, the man of lawlessness, this and that. But it's not about any of that. It's about the revelation of Jesus Christ. I want us to stop for a moment and close our eyes. Picture the expanse of the sky. See the clouds. Feel the breeze of the wind. Smell the moisture in the air. Now hear him calling your name, calling you to come away with him. And as you focus your gaze, a radiant light bursts forth. It's your beloved, Yeshua. The hairs of his head white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes like a flame of fire, his feet like burnished bronze refined in a furnace, and his voice like the roar of many waters. In his right hand he holds seven stars. From his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword, and his face is like the sun shining in all its brilliance. How has the Lord instructed you during these times? Share in the comments that others might be blessed. And in case you forgot, I am not a financial professional. This video is for informational purposes only. Listen at your own risk. It is not intended to be financial or investment advice. Seek a licensed professional for financial or investment advice. Peace be with you, beloveds, as we fix our gaze on Him.